I'm a, uh, an entrepreneurial investor. Um, I'm a poor guy that invests my own money because I don't trust anybody else, basically. Um, I started, I graduated at Howard University, Washington, D.C. Um, afterwards, I had a, a variety of, uh, uh, went for Prudential for nine months, and then um, we decided mutually that corporate America really wasn't for me. Um, and I had a variety of adventures, uh, sold uh, financial software that I might, my, made myself. I uh, had a dot com. Basically, I did Google Docs and Google Drive before Google Docs and Google Drive. That's between 1993 and about 1997. Um, I used to commute to London to try and get some of the uh, Londoners to dig in. Didn't work. Um, the dot com bubble burst. I felt I had a very viable platform, but bikini.com got a $30 million investment. The most I ever got was a $1.7 million offer, which, if you know the inflated prices of uh, dot com stocks, was an insult. But I did learn that you needed more than a good idea in a business model. You know, bikini.com sold, sex sells, marketing sells. So I learned my lesson from that. And then I started investing in real estate at 2000. And um, during that time, we were undergoing in Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn is where I was investing. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the area, but it's right out of the side of Manhattan, walking distance over the bridge. And it was undergoing gentrification where basically the uh, more educated uh, sector was moving in, moving out the working class, and you had easy credit. Um, and I'm a contrarian investor, so I went for distressed property. Basically, brownstones would have purchased a four-story, four-unit um, uh, small apartment buildings. And um, I wanted something that was considered worthless by everybody else. So you buy deep into money with a distressed asset, you had on top of that um, easy credit, and on top of that gentrification, you had a natural fundamental push upward. Um, and I still started buying deep into money, and I, I would attempt to rectify whatever problems they were, bring it to market price, take out some equity, wash, rinse, repeat. The easy credit got easier and easier and easier, and then it turned into a bubble. And so I would get properties for free or buy them for 400,000 US. Um, three or four years later, they're I'm um, comping out at $1.3, $1.4 million and giving um, you know, eighty dollars to $100,000 a month in rent roll. These are properties that I pay negative know, $6,000 for, basically, um, you know, after the financing. And so I did fairly well uh, from a return perspective. I did very well, both cash on cash and leverage. But it got to the point where 2 plus 2 started to equal like 193. And I'm not that good at math. I'm not. But I know it's not 193, right? Is that right? Okay, so you agree with me. So, um, and it got to the point where I said this is going to end well. So the key was to build a portfolio for the family. You know, you know, pass away 140 years sometime in the future because I plan on being here for a while, and uh, leave it to them. But I said, you know, it's just gotten topsy turvy. So I sold off in 2006 ish. Six months after the last building was sold, one got caught up in litigation and by soaked up all the profits. By the way, so um, you know. Didn't, just nasty memory. Um, six months after the last sale, the market in New York collapsed. And between those six months, I said, you know, I want to short everybody who ever did business with me because two plus two just doesn't equal 193. Um, I didn't come from the typical Harvard Business School, um, Goldman Sachs prop trading desk background. So I said, I need to market myself. You can't market a hedge fund directly. At least back then, you couldn't. And uh, I spent an enormous amount of money creating you know, hedge fund documents with a big overpriced Manhattan law firm. But simultaneously, I created a blog called Boom Bus Blog for naming after the economic cycle that was being created by central banks. Instead of smooth growth, it's boom, bust, boom, bust. And every boom and every bust got more and more exaggerated. Um, and I did my own research because I didn't really trust sell-side research. It's not research, it's marketing and you know, sales for support the trading desk and the investment banking desk. And um, my contrarian perspective um, wasn't well received in the beginning, but it worked. And you know why? Because 2 plus 2 doesn't equal 193. So when that 193 reverts back to mean and goes back to 4, you have compression, which is very destructive. So we call the collapse of Bear Stearns, we call it Lehman Brothers, General Growth Properties, which was the second largest um, mortgage in the United States. Um, we did the European debt crisis. We did 
by country by country, by the way. We did Spain, Italy, Ireland, and Portugal, and we called them in order. Um, we did uh, the fall of Apple relative to Google, uh, the collapse of Research in Motion, which was at maker of BlackBerry. So altogether, you know, about 87 to 100 calls between 2007 and 2014. In 2011, one of my um, clients asked me to look into Bitcoin. I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know. So 2012, I asked again. I'm like, I'm busy. You know, I don't have time to play games. So 2013, they were persistent. I looked into it. Um, I, by calling all those big collapses and having them happen, I, I gained sort of a guru status. Um, people thought I was smart. In reality, I just knew 2 plus 2 didn't equal 194. I read the Bitcoin wiki, I read the Bitcoin um, white paper, and my jaw just dropped, literally hit the ground. I was in shock. I'm looking over my shoulder to make sure nobody else saw what I was reading. And then I realized I got off the internet and everybody was able to see it. And I'm like, here we have autonomous money that had its own transportation rails that was programmable and didn't rely on any centralized authority at all, free of money center banks, free of central banks. This is nirvana, if you know what to do with it. So now, I'm like, this is too good to be true. So um, I tested the code to see if it worked. I had a program to get the stuff to compile. It worked. We created a smart contract, a digital swap that worked and created it on its own um, with no bank or broker involved. And then I called around to see why everybody else didn't do it. And I'm getting, well, the code is beta. It doesn't work. Oh, no, they just compiled it. It does work. Well, nobody's really interested in smart contracts. That's nonsense. Maybe you just didn't understand what they were doing. But how could the whole world not understand what they were doing? So after about a month and a half of due diligence, I said, you know, there's something here. I shuttered Boomba's blog, and I stopped writing for it. Writing is very intensive intellectually, having to think a lot. Um, and uh, I started what was basically Veritasium in 2013, mid-2013. Um, we settled, cleared and settled the first functional digital peer-to-peer -peer swap, December 2013. Um, in April and May of 2014, we filed an application for patent protection. I believe, and I actually had my analysts check 280-something patent filings, that I beat everybody to the punch on that, including all the big banks and all the technology firms. But um, I had this esoteric idea that Bitcoin wasn't for money remittances and wasn't money at all, but it's really um, an extant system, an uh, infrastructure that we can replace investment banks and exchanges. And everybody says, no, it's digital currency that sends stuff back and forth and compete with the Western Union. You know, so I think bigger than that. I was basically a pariah. I thought I was insane, et cetera. Um, they said, you should stick to finance and all technology as if there's really not that big a difference. Everything is finance once money is involved. That's you know, the way I look at it. So 2013, 2014, 2015 it seems sort of weird. 2016, a few of the companies started waking up. 2017. Ethereum caught wind, they started the ICOs in mass, and um, people started understanding the business model, or they th I thought they started understanding the business model, but again, most of the startups coming through the four were software engineers and computer programmers. They weren't businessmen, they weren't finance guys. Um, that gave me an advantage, and then I started developing Veritasium by moving it to the Ethereum blockchain and creating basically the world's first automated um, investment vehicle, um, fed by pure fundamental research and forensic analysis, which is what my team does. Um, I meant to have research reports printed out, but I don't know why I said it. There's no way in the world I had anywhere in enough time to even find a printer to print it out. But um, if you go to the front page of our website, you could download the Populous report. Populous is an invoice factoring startup based upon the blockchain. Steve Williams, Steve Nico Williams is the CEO and the founder. And like I said, he's a UK resident. I think he's London. Is it London? Yeah. Okay. I should see him before I leave. Yeah. Um, we have his uh, major competitor, I guess you could call it. They're not direct competitors. PayPal, which is also invoice factoring based out of Canada. Um, this puts the Populous Report to shame. It's about 74 pages altogether. It's Twitter for us. Um, our research reports on these crypto assets are vastly superior to Merrill Lynch's research reports on Apple and Google. The PayPal report is more substantial. And the Considerably more, yes. And uh, what's your opinion on the populist report? Excellent. That was my question. Yeah, that's excellent, well. absolutely excellent. What what what, what stands out? To you? Uh, the what? detail. So what you're looking at here 
if you try and compare what's out there in the industry, the only thing that comes close is WES ratings, which is got a far rating. Okay. And if you look at that, it's, it's a very poor um, implementation of what ratings should be. They're trying to capitalize on their equity uh, uh, subscription base. And if you look at what uh, Reggie's got, not only has it blown away what what's there, mm. you can see that the amount of time spent on the detail and mm. the, the analysis in terms of the revenue projections based on what's out there potentially in the industry is using proper metrics, proper analytics. Okay. That is not what you see in anything out there yeah. today. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt that the PayPal report is significantly, not just materially, significantly superior to the Poplar's report. How many things is that? It's about 73. 73. The Poplar's was about 52. Um, these reports are real. We give valuation ranges, minimum, maximum, and likely. Um, we give the metrics behind it, how it's put together, sensitivity analysis, comparables, the whole nine. Um, we don't have any competition in this space. Now, after we develop the report, it's fed into our financial machine, which is a VEDA, which basically takes it, it goes out into the market, it buys the actual tokens between the valuation range, and creates a model portfolio. Now, everybody can now go in, if you have very tokens, I can't remember, it's not an investment, it's a key to get in. I say this because the regulators in the U.S. are uh, stringent. That's a politically, politically correct way of saying it, right? To say the very least, okay? You put the key in, the very allows you in, then you can take your capital, your Ethereum, and in the future it would be a fiat lock, say U.S. dollar, euro, et cetera, to go and purchase the portfolio. It attempts to replicate the portfolio for you, okay? Now, it's not a perfect replication because you know, things happen. For instance, certain tokens could be outside the valuation range, so they wouldn't be purchased because they're overpriced. Um, you know, the price would have went up, or the bid ask spread is too wide, or they're not available, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it replicates to the best of its ability that portfolio for you. And you can now benefit in the increase or decrease in price. Um, as a matter of fact, you, could, you create the terms of the portfolio yourself by creating a smart contract on your own. And you change the length of the contract, from one minute to 99.9 .9 years, um, et cetera, et cetera, very simple form, which I'll show you. I'll show you the VEDA work. I'll open it up, I'll pass it around. You can take a look at it and play with it yourself. Very simple interface. It's serverless, which means that there is no server that runs 24 um, seven. The most of it is implemented through smart contracts on a blockchain. No blockchain, no major blockchain has been hacked here before, very, um, as of yet. So very secure. It runs very quickly for a blockchain app the very, very simple interface. The trader portion is centralized, but it's not a server, it's stateless or serverless. So it just exists as computer code on a hard drive. When there's a need for it, like the purchase of a, app, of a token, it creates a server, spins itself up, creates a server, execute what needs to be, executes what needs to be done, and then destroys itself and falls back down. Which means in order to hack it, you need to find out where it is, get through whatever security there is, to that server farm or that cloud farm, then you have to um, actually hack the server itself. And you have to do all that in the four to five seconds that it's in existence or it's gone. If you do succeed in doing all that, which is unlikely, the only thing you could force it to do is what it was designed to do, which was to buy or sell that asset. Uh, and you would have to theoretically pay our very fee to do it. So interesting system. Okay, between a fortitude of the blockchain and a serverless architecture, even the web pages that come down um, exist on a distributed hard drive. So it's a hard drive that's spread throughout the world on multiple computers that come together to serve the web pages when it's needed. So, very, and very simple. Most of the stuff is made by developers, apparently for developers, because most of it is hard to understand. You know, difficult in the face, ugly, relatively. Not to be offensive to the guys, but I don't like it. And um, our stuff is very intuitive. You can judge for yourself um, in about maybe 20, 30 minutes when I spin it up. Okay, so that's the two product offerings as for right now, research and the Vader. Do you employ your own development team or do you outsource to a company, like a trusted company? Um, I have both. So I employ a small team, but it's very hard to find the expertise and I outsource as well. I treat my outsource guys and my team very well um, and uh, we're looking to grow. Um, expertise in this field is hard to get and when you go find experts, you get a lot of the prima donna attitudes. 
you know, I'm sought after by everybody in the world, and I demand, you know, a high six-figure, you know, income plus bonus. And the guys get barely quote that we had a wet paper bag. But because they've been doing Solidity, which is a program like for blockchain, there is a lot of demand for their services. For Ethereum. For Ethereum. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, I've found that it's better just to hire a strong um, employee or candidate and then let them learn the blockchain stuff. Um, much wider pool. Actually, the only one who knew, when we started, the only one who knew um, the Ethereum ecosystem was me. And I'll be not honest with you, when I was doing the ICO, I had to postpone it for a week, a week and a half, because I had to learn Ethereum, because I came from the blockchain, the Bitcoin world. You know, not complex. I understand BLTs in general, so I had to pick up on basically the ins and outs of the, uh, um, you know, Ethereum wallet, you know, transmission system, gas, etc. cetera. Um, my lead developer at the time, his name is Patrick, he's on the site, um, didn't know anything about Ethereum. He had to get up to speed, it took him two to three weeks. Um, and th between the two of us, we knew the most. Everybody else was totally fresh. I hired a bunch of other people, including Lorna. None of them knew anything. Lorna was introduced to this business by me. Um, yet, everybody performs. All the professionals who knew Solidity told me the video couldn't be built. So my guys came on board, learned Ethereum, we hired some more, contracted some more, and we built what couldn't be built according to the ex experts. So that's a long way of saying that expertise is what we're seeking, not necessarily um, domain-specific knowledge. Yeah. So the Veda, the Veritasium project is one year, one day old. Okay, we have a fully ready, fully production-ready product. We have a full research staff. We have the best research in the industry. We have patent filings all over the world um, being prosecuted. We believe we beat everybody to the punch, and we are going a world tour. Full transparency. That's what our business is in an extent. So we use those smart contracts to build business logic in and replicate industries vertically. We pick finance and investment because it's low-hanging fruit. The financial industry, Wall Street and Downing Street, no, nah, not Downing, that's government here, right? City, yeah. uh, the city, yeah. Yeah. Um, Bay Street in Canada, Tokyo, et cetera, Singapore. These banking institutions, financial institutions, but Wall Street in particular, which founded, basically was the start of excessive compensation, is the only industry where the employees make more than the owners of the company. The only industry, which is outrageous. You know, 35 to 60 percent of gross revenues goes to compensation. And then their expenses of running the company, and then the owners get the rest. So I can cut that down by 85 to 90 percent. So, so, so what would you say is the why then of Veritasium? What is driving you to make this decision? Driving me personally? Yeah. Um, it's just the way my brain works. Um, my brain, I'm an anarchist. I wouldn't say anarchist. I'm a, a what's a more descriptive way of putting it? Um, I'm, a, I'm a capitalist. That's what I am. But a, a true capitalist. A capitalist means basically um, meritorious compensation, survival of the fittest. Not survival of those who are already on top who built the moat around them, but survival of the fittest. Um, because I wasn't born on the top and because uh, I actually believe in being compensated for my due efforts and my capabilities, I thrive in an environment that rewards that. I don't thrive in an environment that is ran by oligarchs where the vast majority of progression is based upon who you know or where you were born. Now, I know more people and more people know me because I'm becoming more popular, but I'm becoming more popular because I performed. So I'm trying to recreate the world in a meritorious perspective, um, which is good news to many, but there are many who don't want to see that and see that as a threat. And that's where we stand. That's why I'm doing Veritasium. And now the technology is available where that's actually quite doable. Um, the back end of the Vader app allows you to create tokens. It's called VE tokenization. And the Vader is like our software suite. You know, you have Microsoft Office, we have Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Access. Well, the Vader has uh, VE tokenization, uh, VE exposure, VE rent, where you can rent tokens back and forth where people don't have very, or don't have the capital. You can team up with somebody and then do an exposure. So if you have the very the keys to get in and no capital, you can team up and split the profits. So if you have the capital but no keys, we can team up with some with keys to go in and split the profit. But VE tokenization basically allows you to instantly tokenize something else. So what you do is you take the very token, if anybody has one, the little 
you take this token, okay, and you drop a physical asset in there. Suppose you want to tokenize Decante water, right? You take the water, you drop it in the very token, the token wraps around it. Now this water bottle can ride through the Ethereum blockchain, just like a native token such as Populous or PayPal or Veritasium. Now, once it does that, you have the advantages of the blockchain. Immutability, inability to be hacked, full transparency, the ability to write smart contracts and program the behavior of it. So I can say, I will sell you that bottle for 15 pounds between the hours of 2 and 5 p.m. on odd days, business days only. And I can actually give you that bottle without taking compensation up front because the blockchain and smart contracts can force um, both execution and if you escrow the capital for the deal up front into the blockchain and it forces payment. I don't know you. I don't know your credit score. I don't know your balance sheet. I don't know your intent. You could be up to malfeasance. It doesn't matter to me because the blockchain enforces everything. So it allows me to do business with a total stranger without having to worry about anything else. The physical assets, how do you handle administration? It all depends on what the physical asset is and how we do it. You can use this physical, let's use this building, okay? You veritize the building by, um, you do something simple, first of all, um, taking the deed, right? And in the U.S., I know in Africa, they call it dematerialization. Um, what we would do is simply take the deed. You can make the deed legally in certain states in the United States, legally put it on the blockchain. So if the deed is legally now a digital asset, then uh, we're going to keep adjudication to the side because adjudication um, relies on laws. The laws have not kept up with the blockchain as of yet. But most laws, if you... Uh, most laws for contracts should apply to the uh, blockchain. I think it's Wyoming, but I don't know. Ha two or three states, including Delaware, has made a small contract legally binding contract. Wisconsin. So, in, excuse me? Wisconsin. 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 Okay, I knew it was a W state, right? Thank you. So, um, um, with that being the case, you really don't have much of an issue because now you can use precedence in case law. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you still could have some um, ambiguity. In terms of You have an oracle, a data source, and as long as all parties agree on a data source, there's nothing to debate. Uh, an example would be uh, stock. I take IBM stock, I put it into an LLC, I veritize the shares of the LLC. Now, that IBM stock, that um, company, IBM stock trades through the blockchain. IBM has a stock price that is coming from, say, Reuters or S&P or Bloomberg. We all agree that Bloomberg would be the official price as a oracle, and now the truth is transmitted into the blockchain. So you could say, well, I thought IBM was priced at 100, you could say 118, but you rely on the oracle. You've already agreed before you escort the capital. Mm -hmm. And the oracle is basically a software or a server that feeds information in that everybody in the contract agrees with. If you have a dispute, it's too late to dispute because you already agreed to the contract. Mm -hmm. um, Small contracts can't be breached, unlike legal contracts and social contracts. That's where we're going to have an issue with the Wisconsin ruling and Delaware, et cetera, because a lot of people assume that you can unwind a contract given certain situations. Small contracts, unless you put the ability to unwind it, can't be unwound. Two plus two is always going to equal four in the blockchain world. Um, you had a question? We take the token, we drop a kilogram, an ounce, a gram into the token, and now that gold rides along the blockchain. So you could take kilogram and you could send it from your phone to that guy over there. He could take it and send it to you. You could send it to him. We could do this very easily with 14 second block confirmations. Um, we could do it for pennies. Uh, the kilogram is about $46,000 and you could send it for about 14 cents um, with full transparency. Everybody knows where it goes. Whenever you want to redeem that kilogram or ounce or gram, um, you simply bring it to the redemption window, which is me right now, because it's a proof of concept. I'm not paying for a whole mechanism, and I give you the gold. It's just that simple. There are targets. You know, you make enemies, you make friends. You just got to make sure you bounce it. So if you make a powerful enemy, you got to make sure you make powerful friends. If that powerful enemy makes its money by doing wrong to the other people, if you cripple his business model, you make friends on the other side. Day one, man decided to walk upright. You had oligarchies of power, socially formed, economically formed. One day, some guy, you know, probably by mistake, was carrying a boulder, fell, and it broke in a round fashion. 
and then he tried to pick it up and it rolled instead of him picking it up. Wow, the invention of the wheel. He did it three more times and he put something on top of it and now you had a cart. And now he's able to transform more, more stuff from cave A to cave B than the other guy. He made more money, paradigm shift, power shift. That family, that clan now have more power than the other one. The other one didn't cooperate. They didn't want it to happen. Mother Market doesn't ask your opinion as to when she decides to shift. Some other guy fell and scraped two rocks together, a spark came out, landed in dry grass, and fire came. With the invention of fire, now you could work 24 hours a day versus sun up to sundown. Then you have the combustion engine, the IC chip, the microcomputer, the internet, and now the blockchain. Paradigm shifts, and each paradigm shift has a compression of time between it. The network effect, Metcalf's law. And so that's the way the world works. My Success doesn't rely upon whether someone likes me or whether someone wants it to happen. When you develop your application, have you abstracted it from the, the, the protocol layer so that if you wanted to, you could port to a different protocol? I am blockchain agnostic, but Ethereum has a significant head start. It is very easy to find the holes and weaknesses in Ethereum after Ethereum is launched. It's been operating for four years, or three years. Um, the issue is each and every other one of those platforms are going to have similar issues, holes, and weaknesses, but you're not going to find out what they are until several years from now when they get operating. And Ethereum is not standing still. Ethereum 2.0 is just about ready for me to understand. Honestly, I could care less you know, who succeeds, who fails. I know a lot of the Ethereum guys personally. Um, Joe Lupin, who's the founder of Consensus, his office is right in Brooklyn, right where I live. Um, he was one of the first guys I met in the business, actually. Uh, what's your understanding of um, the increase, like, increase in the supply in order to meet the demand? Or supply the of what and demand for what? Um, it's not really understanding. I control roughly 98% of the very, and I sell it to those who will add value to the ecosystem. It's really just that simple. So, so that number would never increase? Or? Of course it's going to increase because hopefully, <laughs> you know, I grow. For instance, um, let's suppose I'd get Nigeria to come on board, which is the number three or four oil producer in the world, between three and five, I don't, the stuff shifts, so I can't memorize it. And they have the uh, largest economy in Africa, and they have the second largest uh, exchange in Africa. So I decided they want to come aboard, especially knowing how strategic Africa, and I didn't get to Asia and Europe yet, because I didn't have time, or the Americas, because everybody plays a very strategic role. <laughs> so, and knowing how important and strategic that is, I would, it would behoove me to make access available to a large amount of very tokens, okay, if I want to use the platform. And that goes from large, powerful players to the 11-year-old mathematical genius in Sri Lanka who lives on a farm who outtrades everybody at JP Morgan in Deutsche Bank. The only problem is she doesn't have access. I can give her access to the very token. It's not about how much you are from a financial perspective. It's about how close you align to our mantra and you know, how much you can add to the ecosystem. I don't discriminate through any social, economic, or geopolitical lines. That's not me. I'm a black man from America. The last thing I need to do is start discriminating. Okay? But as you can see, what you guys have, it's not just a technology guy. It's not just a strategy person but, and a finance person, but a person that really thinks globally and it's so vast knowledge and so many different things that he can put this together. And of course, that is why I'm here, because I was taken aback and enthralled by all of his work and his geniusness. So you're not just getting technology, as I said before, but you're getting a guy that has global vision and can put things together. So if you can think it, he can create it. So, so I feel, feel like I should slip for a 20. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.